Hi, I'm Billy Keels, the host of the Going Long Podcast. Every week, I'm going to be here interviewing the absolute best in the business as it relates to real asset investing, as well as real Main Street investors. We're going to be having conversations where you can listen in, and that's going to help you to continue on your path to education so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident in investing long distance. So make sure that you, uh, that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you're liking it as well, because that way you can get every single episode as soon as it comes out. And by the way, don't forget to leave today's episode a five-star review. Let's go ahead and listen to today's conversation. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help educate you so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident investing beyond your backyard. I'm your host, Billy Keels. And you know what? If you've ever wanted to know what it was like to go from diapers to data to dominating the self-storage space, well, then this is absolutely the conversation that you're going to want to listen to until the very end. Because today's guest not only understands the value and the difficulty of making cold calls as it relates to sales. You know, after about 12 years of doing that, he also started to look for something more in terms of quality of life and not just being focused on sales targets. You know, by the time he was 30 years old, he also got into real estate. And since then, he's been able to carve out a really nice niche for himself in the area of self-storage. And he is the Chief Investment Officer of Reliant Real Estate Management. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the show today, Mr. Chris Benson. Chris, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, Billy. Appreciate the time. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to today's call. I appreciated the uh, the pre-conversation that we were having just a little bit ago. And uh, as I mentioned to you before, Chris, so we like to follow a little bit of a pattern here and would love to help have you tell us where exactly are you based in the U.S.? Sure. Uh, I'm talking to you today from our office in Roswell, Georgia, which is uh, just north of Atlanta. Probably most of your listeners recognize where Atlanta is in southeast uh, capital of Georgia. So we're about 20 miles north of that. Um, Roswell's kind of a sleepy little town. Although I say sleepy, it's growing in leaps and bounds, but really neat little town. And our office is right on the main street there. Okay. Awesome. So just, uh, just north of Hotlanta and, uh, in the state of Georgia and Roswell. Fantastic. Listen, also, Chris, what is the, what's the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours? That's a good question, Billy. Um, so we, we for some of your listeners, uh, lacrosse here in the Southeast is growing in popularity. I, I'm originally from New York. Lacrosse in the Northeast is huge. So my 14-year-old son actually had a uh, um, his first uh, fall ball lacrosse tournament yesterday, uh, which was great to see. And uh, we moved here last year with him. So it's been hard transitioning for him and this is a really nice step for him, I think, to uh, to get back involved, engaged. He did great. It was a uh, a beautiful day to watch him fall sports. So um, it was it was a good step for him, and certainly for his mom and I as well. Man, that's uh, that's lovely. So you and your wife being able to watch your son his first fall ball, or in his fall ball and uh, in lacrosse. I don't know much about lacrosse I'm from Ohio, so we didn't play very much there. But I know moving around a lot as a kid, whenever you can get involved in sports and be able to do that and create that camaraderie, that's always awesome. So um, so thanks for sharing that with us, Chris. Yeah, my pleasure. Appreciate it. Listen, I, I gave a couple of really high level things about you and some of the things that you've done, how you got into your focus, but I'd really love for you to share with the Going Long audience. If you can share, some, share a little bit more about your backstory with us, please. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. So um, coming out of college, I worked for uh, basically sale. I was in sales from college um, until I stopped uh, with my last real job. So coming out of school, I worked for a company called ADP. Um, they are B2B payroll sales. And for those of you guys uh, in the US who've come through a sales path, that's one of those kind of foundational sales jobs. Uh, it was great, good learning experience uh, for sure. And then got into medical devices, worked for a division of uh, what used to be uh, Tyco Healthcare, became Covidian. That's how most people know it. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, after that, went to another level of med device um, called uh, Intuitive Surgical. They make the Da Vinci robot. And really, Billy, it was, I remember walking the OR, hmm, I don't know, 2008 or nine um, and seeing the first, the first time I saw a Da Vinci robot. And when you see that technology, just it, it's kind of sci-fi fantasy. Uh, that was sort of a, whoa, what is that? And that looks like that's going to be the future of what medical devices is. So uh, it took me a little bit to get there, but uh, ended up at Intuitive and um that technology and company both incredible. Uh, so it was very fortunate to be a part of it. But um, as you mentioned, you know, there, there comes a point, I think, in everybody's career path where um, I distinctly remember waking up just before I turned 30 and saying, I can't do this 
uh, anymore. And Billy, you, you mentioned it in the conversation we had before um, that we started recording, but the thing that used to get me the worst was being in airports at like Friday at eight, nine o'clock coming home. And you'd see that guy or gal in their fifties, sixties carrying a bag. And I was like, Nope, I'm not doing that. Not um, going to be you, right? Not going to be you at all. Nope. So uh, for me, it was, you know, how do I create that passive income stream in, in real estate? I'm not that smart a guy. So real estate is pretty black and white. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to understand. It's easy to scale. Um, so my wife and I started um, buying some duplexes on the residential side as a side hustle. And um, we kind of scaled from there. Uh, you know, we built, uh, we got to 22 units and it was a nightmare. Hated it. It was, uh, it, it wasn't necessarily the, um, the units that were the issue, like as far as maintenance, we had that process tightened up, but it, it was the people part of it that was really challenging. Um, we had kind of B minus B, B minus type properties. And, um, there was always people issues and it was soul sucking. So, uh, we sold, we sold it and, and actually read or heard a podcast. I wish I could uh, quote who gave it to me. Cause I'd love to give him credit, but um, basically big deals and small deals are the same amount of work. You just make less money in small deals. <laughs> and so, uh, that was sort of the aha moment. And, uh, that's when I decided I wanted to get into uh, commercial real estate. Wow. Okay. So you, so you had that epiphany to get into commercial real estate after having built up to 22 doors and then you realize, well, hang on a second, not but beyond the doors and all this cash that's coming in, there are actually people that are here. <laughs> and so sometimes it's not, everything that it is, um, uh, I guess that everyone says it's going to be right. And so that helped to give you the clarity and then really moving into the, uh, the commercial real estate space. So, so tell us a little bit more about that. And I know we've ta- already started talking about your role as chief investment officer at Reliant Real Estate Management, but so tell us kind of, once you started getting into this commercial space, what, were, what did you start finding? What was it that really attracted you to this versus your previous experience? It was really about scale. Um, You know, the hard part with the single or the duplexes um, was it was going to be really challenging to scale it if I was going to replace my income um, Mm -hmm. to to get to the scale that I needed to. It it was going to be a mess. Um, I think what commercial real estate does, right? And and I started in the multifamily space is, you know, you, you have vacancy of one or two units in a hundred unit property. Well, that's only 2% occupant or, you know, you're going to lost 2% of your occupancy. So mm-hmm. you got one unit in a duplex and now you're 50% occupied. Um, so, you know, it, it was about understanding how to create scale and then, you know, the management efficiencies that came with that size. I mean, my interest Billy and what I enjoyed doing was I, I liked chasing the deal and I liked uh, raising the capital and, you know, inherent of me being a salesperson. And so that's what I wanted to do more of. And um, it's, it's much easier to do that when you're operating with larger properties than, than it was to do with, um, you know, individual residential. So um, that's, that's how I got into commercial multifamily. We ended up uh, my first project, we ended up building a 64 unit apartment complex um, with a partner um, that that was fantastic. I, I learned a ton. And then that's what brought me into investing in some passive income opportunities in other apartment communities across the country. Um, and then, you know, about five years ago, Billy, uh, as apartments got more and more, um, especially here in the US, cap rates have compressed and it's become more and more competitive and uh, pricing has gone a little bit crazy. Uh, that's that's where we started looking at self storage. Um, started as an investor first, and then um, Todd Allen, who's the founder of Reliant, um, and I struck up a partnership in this where uh, you know he needed some help building a, uh, a equity raising platform, and and that's what we did. So uh, it's been four years or three years, I'm sorry, and uh, we moved down to Georgia in the last year, and it's been quite an adventure. Wow. So it. I think anyone who's in sales loves adventures, right? And so you you've been there. And you, when you were talking about as you got into the to, to the role, just curious because we have a lot of people that are in sales that that are listening to us, that are watching us. And as you made that transition uh, in, with Reliant, and you saw kind of some of the opportunities that existed. Natural by nature, us salespeople, you talked about, we like doing deals and things like that. So maybe talk a little bit about what you learned from the sales and and how that has helped you in the role. And like, maybe some of what are, what are some of the things that you have to fight against as you begin to scale, um, having that natural sales ability? 
Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, I, aside from just the basic ability to talk to people, right? I mean, that, that's just probably an underrated skill set that that as salespeople you most likely have. Um, the biggest thing for me was just being able to say, "Hey, here's where I'm trying to go," and build a path to get there, right? And and I don't know if you call that self startedness or you know, I don't need a plan. Um, me personally, and I think this comes from my experience in sales, right? Somebody usually says to you. Hey, here's your quota. Good luck. Um, and then you try to go figure out how you're going to make that. And, and I think for me in real estate, that that was helpful was the ability to say, okay, you know, here's where we need to go. Let's build some, um, some structure and plans around how we're going to get there. Um, you know, I think it, it, it's funny. My buddies and I used to joke when we were all in sales growing up, like, you know, none of us have any appreciable skills, right? All we know how to do is talk to people. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, when you when you get yourself outside of that environment, um, you you really see what you have is pretty valuable. You know, you have the ability to um, parse a plan and put together a plan for yourself. Um, stay self motivated, right? I, mean, I don't need somebody telling me, "Hey, we got to get this done." I mean, it's just kind of inherent. You know, when you when you're used to for so long eat what you kill kind of mentality, um, you know that that permeates into everything. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and so having that ability to deal with ambig dealing with ambiguity, sometimes it, I'll, I guess I'll say that because when you just have a quota and you just go out and run, you, you have to be able to build things and be able to move forward. And so having that own self analysis and an ability to self start, it sounds like it's something that has served you really well. Um, so, so let's get into just self storage, right? Cause it's something that we haven't really talked a lot about Chris. So you're going to help our audience really understand more about this space. And so help us understand just what is the self storage space? Number one, and why move, why, I guess, what is the big attraction to self storage versus, I mean, you've done single family, you've done smaller multifamily, you've done larger multifamily, and that's a lot of the attention goes there. So help start us on the education. What is self storage exactly? And kind of what attracts people to self-storage from an investor standpoint? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, look, self-storage is pretty easy. It's a garage, right? I mean, some garages are heated and air conditioned, but for the most part, you know, it's a cement pad with a bunch of garages on it. And, you know, inherently here in the U S we're playing to U S consumerism and that you know, people here do not get rid of stuff yep. um, and typically don't have enough room to keep it. So they're going to pay for somebody else to have a garage available to them. Um, and if you look at the, the historical growth of self-storage in the U.S., it's been pretty incredible to see, you know, today, 9% of people in the U.S. use a self-storage unit. Um, if you look 20 years ago, that number was like 3%. So it's grown pretty substantially. Um, so, you know, I would say that uh, there's a lot of uh, growth in the marketplace and um, the demand is high. Um, as far as why we made the transition, you know, when I speak to kind of for me, I'm a data person, so I love to um, I love to see you know what the data is telling me and and try to make decisions based off of that. And there are really three pillars around why I came to self storage personally, and and I'll walk you through them really quickly. I can give you the links on this bill. Your your listeners can see the same data set that I saw. Great. Um, I like the National Association of REIT data, and it essentially tracks all of the publicly traded REITs here in the U.S. and um, it gives you a historical view of all the asset classes and you can compare, um, compare and contrast. So when I looked at self-storage, if, if you look at the last 25 years of the asset class, it's done just under 17% a year um, with the REITs, which is fantastic, right? It's outperformed kind of the core four real estate classes we all think of, apartments, retail, office, um, and industrial. So it's outperformed. And then I also believe that everything is pretty cyclical. So mm -hmm. If we're not in a downturn now, there's one coming. And so if you looked at self-storage in 2007, 8, and 9, storage lost less than 4% of its value. Um, apartments lost closer to 7. Office and retail got hit a little bit harder in the double digits. Obviously, here in the U.S., the, the S&P 500 got crushed. Yeah. And so it had some resilience, right? Even in a downturn, people were using it. And, and you know, we're recording this at the beginning of October. COVID here is obviously still a huge deal, but... Again, self-storage has come through this recession fairly resilient. Um, mm -hmm. And knock on wood, we're not out of it yet, but it, it does seem like we're going to have a pretty minor impact. So, you know, you have the historical performance, you have this um, 
recession resiliency. And then the third piece is um, the, the market is very fragmented. So about there's five publicly traded REITs that own about 25% of the marketplace. Mm-hmm. The rest is very fragmented. So it gives an opportunity and a runway for consolidation in scale um, because there are still a lot of mom and pop operators out there. There's still value to be had in the market. And that can't be said in a lot of other asset classes. Okay. So you've got, uh, so you have the, the, the three areas. You, you mentioned one, one statistic in the beginning, you said that the self storage is traditionally done or historically about 17%. Were you referring to returns? Is that IRR cash on cash? Yeah, that's, that's just straight cash on cash returns um, over that 25 year period. Okay. All right. Perfect. So, so that's really helpful. And then you also mentioned something else and I'm just, just curious because maybe other people are asking the same question, Chris. Um, so when you look at the self storage space, um, it is, you know, it's a, it's a garage. You say when we do love our stuff in the United States um, and even more around the world, there's a lot of places here in, in Spain that are popping up all over the place because people like to keep their things uh, as well. But do you have the same kind of dynamic where, you know, you have new development, you have a value add, or you may just have uh, a property that's just, you want to kind of take it over. Maybe you could talk about some of the different plays that are in the self-storage space as well. And maybe particularly where you like to play at Reliant. Yeah. I think all the things, the three categories you just described are the same, Um, you know, just like apartments or, you know, we'll use multifamily as an example. So, um, you know, we certainly have value add plays. You know, we don't go in and put granite countertops and hardwood (laughs) floors and stainless steel appliances. Um, You know, the value add play can be a number of different strategies. There's not really one size fits all for us at Reliant. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's going in and, you know, building some additional units and getting those units leased up. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, sometimes it's operational value add where you're going in, raising rents, bringing back up to market, adding some ancillary income items like, you know, U-Haul truck rentals or point of sale retail items like selling locks and boxes you know, in some cases, some of those ancillary income items are up to 10% of your pro forma income. So wow. you know, they have a pretty substantial impact. So um, yes, on the value add, we do do stabilized deals. You know, what, what we would consider a coupon clipper where you're just going in, running it and collecting the coupon. Um, and then, you know, ground up development. There's certainly ground up development in the space. There's been a significant amount of new development and self storage in the last five years. Um, we do a little bit of it, you know, one or two a year. Um, it, you know, it's it's a, a risky proposition. And so um, for a smaller company like us, you know, it's really got to be a home run for us to, uh, to want to engage. Okay. And so that, that's on the development side. So when you say it's it's more of a risky proposition, just help us understand why that is riskier than a, on a value add, for instance. Yeah, for sure. I mean, value add deals typically are cash flowing day one, right? So you have an existing facility, the property is producing cash flow, maybe it's covering its debt service, and you're doing something, putting some capital expenditure in it to expand or grow net operating income. Mm -hmm. A a ground up development, you're buying a piece of dirt, you may have to go through a a approval process appropriation to get it zoned appropriately. Um, And then, you know, you have risk during the construction period, you can miss, miss budgets, you can overspend, um, more importantly, you know, let's call it that 18 months it takes you to get approved and built. Um, a lot of things can happen in that 18 months, right? A competitor can start building across the street. Something can change in the marketplace. And all the while, you have zero cash flow, right? There is, there is no income coming in from the property. And when you open the facility, you still have zero cash flow. So then you have to get it leased up, right? Where, you know, it's starting to produce its own cash flow, perhaps cover its own debt service. Now there's value to be had in the cost, um, you know, the the, uh, the development cost to where the stabilized value is, right? And that's why people are developing deals because there's money to be made. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly much riskier proposition. And typically, investors who are investing alongside of us are expecting a higher return to take that risk with them. Which and so by being able to take that risk with you, so it goes back to some of the basic principles: higher. Uh, risk profile, potentially higher return. And so that's also, a, sure. I'm, I'm going to uh, make an assumption here and that that is a different type of investor that would be interested in that type of project and versus some type, someone who's interested in more of a value add type of opportunity. That'd be fair. Yeah. I mean, I think Billy, everybody's got their own goals for their capital, right? Yep. And so, you know, depending on who the investor is, if it's an institutional investor or an individual retail investor, 
Um, everybody has kind of their own mandate on what they want their capital to do. There are some investors that say, look, I'm good with a 7% return. I just want no risk or a pretty good chance that I'm never going to lose my capital. And I just want to collect that coupon. And so stabilized deal may be a good opportunity for them. Um, where other investors say, hey, I don't need the cash flow. I'm in it to appreciate equity. So development makes more sense for me. So it's really across the board and each investor, you know, makes their own decision on where they fall on the risk spectrum. I love that you share that perspective as well, because it's really about understanding the the individual investor. What is it that they are looking to achieve? And then, and seeing if there are specific, specific types of uh, projects that will allow them to achieve their, uh, their desired outcome. Right. And, and, not, and I don't always mean, just a financial outcome, right? There's sometimes being part of a specific project in a specific area, uh, as well as the financial aspect. So, so great. Um, you know, you talked about maybe some of the different players because you were talking about institutional investors, individual investors, like in, in the self-storage space, who is like a lot of us salespeople would say, like, who is part of the supply chain? Who are you buying from? Who are you ultimately selling to? And how does that work? Um, I hate to give you the answer. It depends, but it kind of depends. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, the, the marketplace is is dynamic in that there there are five publicly traded REITs um, that, as I mentioned, own you know about a quarter of the 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 market. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's some large regional operators. You know, Reliant. We have 50 properties across eight states, and so we're the 25th largest self storage operator in the U.S. Right. So just to kind of give you a sense of scale. Um, And then there's still a lot of mom and pop type operators. And and when I say mom and pop, think people who own one or maybe two facilities. Got it. You know, something their family built and someone inherited, or maybe they built it 20 years ago and been running it ever since. Um, When you ask the question, who are we buying and selling? You know, the ideal deal for us is a property that kind of mom and pop owner in a facility, in a market that's in the path of progress, right? So you can Mm -hmm. see progress pushing towards it. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe they've hit their investment horizon, you know, maybe they're retiring or whatever the case may be, and they don't want the facility anymore. Um, and then typically we're doing some sort of value add. That's our sweet spot um, to the property, grow, not operating income. Mm-hmm. And our exits, typically we're looking to um, the REITs, you know, selling to one of the REITs um, or institutional capital. So if you think of like the pension funds, insurance companies, um, they're deploying capital at a scale where they're they're looking to deploy in these asset classes. So, um, you know that that's generally um, kind of the the workflow uh, of of our our properties. Um, you know, we've sold thirty six properties in our history, and eighty percent of them have been to the REITs. So that's really been a good exit for us over the years. And so, so being able to have that type of exit plan and those relationships, what you've just done, Chris, is really simplified things for anyone who is interested more in this, in this asset class, right. In, in terms of self-storage, because you talked about, and, and it can depend, right. But it could be something as simple as mom and pops that are really looking to exit for any number of reasons. You're there in the middle, you're helping them. Uh, and then you are also looking at disposition or being able to eventually help the, uh, right. the institutions or, or the REITs. And, and so that really helps paint the picture as to what the, what the supply chain looks like there. So thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Um, you know, when we, like, I guess people are probably calling you all the time, right. And want to know more about what you're doing at Reliant. And I always think about as a strong operator, what are some of the things that, um, you recommend or that you like to talk about when, when someone is looking to, in, well, to entrust their goals, dreams to an operator like Reliant in the self-storage space, like what, I've never done that before. So what should I be thinking to ask you um, to understand more about how your operations run or what I should be thinking about? Are you asking Billy more around like what due diligence should you as an investor be doing on an operator? Yeah, exactly. So someone who's, so imagine you've never, you don't know anything about self-storage and we're having this conversation today and I really am interested in finding out more, like what things should I be asking someone who is an operator in the self-storage space? Because you know what? This is kind of the first time that I'm ever having exposure to it. Yeah, I mean, I think look, it, it goes back to kind of goals of your capital again, right? Is uh, you know what what we talk about a lot with investors that we speak with is you know generally you got to be comfortable with a couple things. Is one the illiquidity of your investment, right? Billy, you go invest in a self storage REIT here in the U.S. You can trade in and out of that daily if you want, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, with us, you know, typically our projects kind of have a five to seven year hold time. Okay. And, and money's locked up 
um, for at least that long. It could be shorter. It could be longer. And so people have to be comfortable and be paid a premium for that illiquidity. Um, and the other aspect that I think investors need to be thoughtful of is the control piece. You know, when, when we say passive investing, this is as passive as it gets, right? So you're really entrusting a lot to the operator. And so um, you, you have no control as a passive investor over what we are doing with it, right? So you want to make sure that, you know, one, we, we have a, a historical track record where you're investing to make sure what they're saying they're going to do, they've done in the past. Um, and that's where I think you really want to focus um, your energies is understanding who, you know, when you make an investment in real estate, it's kind of a misnomer. You're actually investing in the people behind it. And so when you invest with Reliant, yes, there's a property there, there's a fund there, but really it's the people of Reliant that you're putting your money with. And, and that's true of almost all investing. So, you know, I know for me and on, on my passive income investments, I, I really want to understand the people. Um, and, and what they're trying to accomplish. And then obviously the track record, because you know, I'm a believer that history is a pretty good predictor of what's going to happen moving forward. Yeah, definitely. And, and so I think this is one of the unique things that you're able to also bring as chief investment officer is not only have you done the active part of, of, of investing in real assets, right? We talked about the 22 units that you built up to while you were working. Um, you've also have the gone through the due diligence of being a passive investor. And so you're able to speak to both of those brains uh, for anyone who's interested in, in learning more about the, the specific asset class. And I think that that is, that is great. And, and anyone who is speaking to you and Reliant will, will get the benefit of, of your previous experience. Um, another thing, so this is something that comes up a lot, right? Is the kind of the rate of, well, more rate of return, but people will typically talk about risk adjusted rates of return. And so I'm, I'm always curious because this is one of these kind of nebulous terms people always talk about. When you think about risk adjusted return, what does that mean to you or what I guess someone would think about, you know, investing in self storage versus investing in, um, I don't know, something else in the stock market. So maybe you could share that your, your definition of risk adjusted return with us. Um, I, I, again, I think it's dependent on each individual investor and how they view this. But, but I mean, typically, risk adjusted is is a, a you know a, a adjusting for volatility in the marketplace. Like, how much swing up and down are you going to see um, for the rate of return that you're going to get? And you know, generally, people like real estate because it's non correlated to the equities market. So, you know, these stock market goes up and down. Our values are based off of income, income and cap rates, right? So if your income is staying pretty constant and the market hasn't changed drastically for your particular asset class, generally values stay pretty constant. You know, um, if, if you drop revenues in your property, well, then value is going to go down, um, but it's not tied to the stock market. So, you know, I, I would say, you know, risk adjusted return is one of those terms that says I'm balancing how much return could I potentially get with the potential downside of this type of investment. And generally, the risk adjusted return of real estate is lower than, you know, particular equities in the market. And it depends on what equities you're looking at, um, you know, large cap versus small cap and all, all in between. Um, but yeah, generally, that's what risk adjusted return is, is looking at. All right, perfect. So I appreciate you sharing that your 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 definition of the risk adjusted return because it is something that's really important. And I just want to highlight uh, to all of our viewers and all of our listeners one of the things that you said, which is really important when you talked about the non correlated asset, because it it is not dependent on what happens with the marketplace, and it is dependent on being able to generate income. And I think that is so key. And I appreciate you sharing that because it is it is a key concept um, in in terms of looking at different uh, different types of assets. Um, Chris, you talked a little bit about, um, the fund. And so I, one of the things I didn't mention, but I'm glad that you did is that you're the 25th uh, largest operator uh, in self storage in, in the U S and I know that you have a particular way of, uh, of raising funds. I think if memory serves me correctly, you had a, a $50 million fund that was able to, to, to go out and acquire some hundred million dollars worth of assets, more or less. If, if I've gotten that wrong, please let me know. Um, but the, the whole concept of, of a fund that you would be raising or putting together. What does that look like? What is that all about? This is maybe something new for, for a lot of people. Sure. I mean, I think the best analogy I could use, Billy, is think mutual fund versus an individual stock. So okay. there, there are investment opportunities where people invest in one singular property. 
And, and that's like investing in a stock, right? If I'm going to buy a share of, you know, Amazon, for example, I'm, I'm investing just in Amazon. You know, if I'm buying a mutual fund that in, includes Amazon, there may be 25 other companies that make up the performance of that fund. And so Reliance done it both ways. We've done individual syndications. You mentioned um, Reliance Self Storage Fund 1. Um, that ended up being $47 million in equity. And you're right, about 116 million of acquisition properties, right? So investors in that fund uh, essentially are invested at the fund level. There were 11 properties there. So their performance is based off the performance of those 11 properties. And so hopefully, you know, it's spread across four states, multiple markets, multiple business plans. Hopefully it gives them the investors some diversification where, you know, if one property gets hit, um, or if something happens, you know, new supply comes to market, there's some sort of impact in their market. Mm-hmm. It's the performance of the fund buoys um, the, the downside of that particular market. So the goal is really, you know, diversification um, for, for our investors. And, you know, we, we launched our second fund here at the beginning of the summer um, to do essentially the same thing, right? So the goal is to give people access to the asset class and create a diversified portfolio in which they can do it. So you're really focusing on a specific asset class. It sounds like you're doing it geographically. And that's also one of the things that we love here, as you know, in the Going Long podcast, it's really being able to invest beyond your backyard and feeling much more comfortable and confident in doing that. And I always love asking the question, Chris, like when you are in a specific city, like a lot of the books always tell us, well, just invest here because in that way you can see it. But, you know, at Reliant, you are very um, strategically deciding to go outside of your state and go to multiple states. Talk us to us a little bit about why you've decided to do it that way. Um, just once again, to help people understand that it, it is possible to invest beyond your backyard. You just have to have very clear reasons as to why you're doing it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for for us, um, it's it's about yield, right? It's it's about finding where what markets are going to produce the yield that us and our investors are are looking for. And so, you know, there's there's a lot of investors, for example, who live in the Bay Area in California who want to invest in real estate, but it's too expensive there, right? So they're looking at markets outside, you know, to your point, their backyards to find yield. Um, and, and there's definitely uh, a learning curve to that and risk, you know, risk to being outside your perspective. We're, you know, we have a, enough scale now where, you know, we can kind of manage going into new states. Um, but for an individual investor, that's scary, right? Because you can't, can't drive, maybe you have to get an airplane to go see it and you're trusting somebody else. And so, you know, I think that's also the, the decision a lot of our investors make, Billy, between being an active investor versus a passive investor. You know, we have a lot of people who invest in our platform who are saying, look, I'd love to be a direct investor, but I have my day job. You know, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a business owner, I'm a salesperson, whatever it is. And that's where I'm deriving my income. I just want access to the asset class. And I'd much rather, you know, partner with somebody, a professional operator who I know is going to do a better job than I can individually. And and look, there are some people who say, hey, I'm I'm going to go be a direct investor. That's what I said. You know, I'm going to go do it myself. And there's more money to be made that way, right? But it's always a balance between time and money. And, um, you know, you're going to bump your toe along the way. And I certainly did that. Um, so, you know, I think that's that's kind of the balance as an investor you have to strike to say, hey, can I go do this myself? Or do I just really want access to the asset class? And I go partner partner with somebody who knows what they're doing. And, and, and I know I'm, I'm sure that part through your process, you or your process, you help people to understand, you know, do you want to be active? Do you want to be passive? If you want to be passive, these are the types of things that we're doing. So um, look, there, I know we could probably keep talking forever, but before we kind of get into the going long final three, I, I do have a question for you. If you, if you kind of think of where you, you are now uh, with Reliant and you kind of look forward now we're in 2020. So things are a little bit unique, right? And talked about we're in October now. Mm-hmm, sure. Um, Kind of help us understand where are you? Close your eyes, and we're 24 months into the future. We're in 2022. Kind of what do things look like? How what, how's business look? How, how are you? Uh, how many people are you helping to get closer to their dreams and goals? Well, I mean, I think uh, for for us as a company, um, our our goal is to to uh, fund fund two right. So can complete that funding, get that portfolio together. I mean, I think for for us, what we see is a consolidation play in the marketplace with self storage. So, as I mentioned, still a lot of mom and pop owners. Um, Reliant becomes a really interesting company. You know, we're at fifty properties now. 
we, we become really interesting at a hundred, um, you know, and then we have a portfolio of a pretty good scale where, you know, we can buy and sell chunks of those um, because there's some value to selling a portfolio versus an individual asset. So I think as a company, you know, we want to continue to to grow that portfolio and take advantage of that opportunity um, and obviously deliver great returns to our investors. I mean, none of this works unless, you know, we're delivering a number on the back end. Right. So um, I think, you know, we, we want to continue to do that and, um, and hopefully scale the portfolio to, um, you know, maybe it, the number is not really relevant. You know, we're not like, Hey, we want to be a top 10 self-storage operator. It's sort of arbitrary, but I, you know, Todd Allen, who's one of the co-founders of Reliant would say his goal is to take care of the people who got him here. Right. And, yeah. you know, he's built a, a pretty incredible machine and, um, you know, he wants to continue that so that there's growth opportunities for people in the organization. All right. So perfect. So continue to look for growth opportunities within the organization, be continuing to be able to help uh, those that helped uh, Reliant to get to where, where you are today. And that, that makes a lot of sense. And it's not always about the money at the same time, if it, if the, if the finance draw return is not happening, it, it makes it difficult for people to get to their real dreams and goals and things like that. So it all makes sense. And I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, so Chris, I guess it is that time to get into the going long final three. And the thing is, is I never ask the question unless you tell me that you're ready for me to ask you the going long final three. So are you ready? Sure. <laughs> All right, here we go. So first question is really help us understand. I talked about me being here in Barcelona, Spain, and I'm always interested for from all of our guests. What is your favorite European city, either that you visited or you still have on your bucket list to uh, to visit? Uh, I'll go bucket list on that one. So I'm a big skier, outdoors type person. Uh, I know I'm in Georgia and now I have to jump on an airplane to access snow, but um, Chamonix in France is oh, yeah. obviously on a kind of a bucket list of all skiers. Uh, there's some incredible, pretty incredible descents there. And, yeah. Um, a lot of terrain. So it's on the list. Uh, we haven't been able to do it in the last five years, but next five, especially as the kids get older, it's a lot easier to do. Yeah. Chamonix is a wonderful place. So uh, that goes uh, on the list. We'll include that in the show notes as well. Um, also, Chris, listen, you are a, a successful uh, individual, uh, a successful <clears throat> uh, person as the chief in, investment officer. And I always say that, you know, successful people have only made one mistake in our entire lives, right? Um, no, but seriously, like if you can think of one mistake that you have made, maybe you thought it was a mistake at the time, but you took away a really important lesson. What was the lesson that you took away from uh, from that experience? Yeah, I, I'm going to go as broad based to apply to as many people as I can. I think for me, first getting into real estate, the hardest part was the first deal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the ability to jump. It's very easy. And, and as I mentioned, I'm a data person. So it's really easy to get analysis paralysis and just, you know, churn through stuff and just say to yourself, I'm learning. Well, you can learn for five years and not actually do anything. Um, so I think, you know, and, and I'm not saying I'm this brave, individual, intrepid individual that just jumps into everything. I'm not. But what I have learned is the, the best learning experiences that I've had have been when I'm willing to make the jump and jump in. And I don't know everything. And I know that going in, right. Um, but being able to jump in and say, all right, I'll figure this out. And, you know, I've, I've had enough experiences in my life to kind of bet on myself and say, you know, if you give me enough time, I'll, I'll figure it out. And there, there's going to be some bumps and bruises along the way. So back to my mistake, I'd, I'd say the biggest one for real estate was that I didn't jump in sooner. Um, and, you know, it, everything that the most powerful investment vehicle in the world is time, right? So it doesn't really matter what you invest in. If, if you'd started when you were 18, it's probably going to turn out okay. Um, and there's another quote that I love. Everything's a good deal in real estate in 20 years, right? So <laughs> in 20 years, almost everything's worth more then than it is now. So, um, you know, I think that that's the big one that I would encourage everybody is educate to a point and then you got to jump in and give it a run. All right. Love that, man. Just, uh, just jump in, uh, don't get stuck in analysis paralysis and, uh, also to, yeah, 20 years to, to do a lot of things to, to make the decision look fantastic. Uh, and lastly, I always want to be able to feed the mind. So what book would you, would you recommend to uh, the going long audience? Um, have you heard of the alchemist? Yes. That's a, that's a fun one. I, uh, I recently reread that my wife gave it to me a while ago. It's, 
Paulo Coelho. Coelho. Yep, exactly. Coelho. Yep. Um, interesting. It's an interesting book. Um, if, if you're kind of looking for a path, you know, if you're in that part of your life where you're not sure necessarily what the next step is or where it should go. Um, it's a great, uh, great story. I think that's applicable to a lot of people's lives and um, certainly gives a little bit of clarity as to as how you should approach it. All right. Fantastic. So the alchemist will get that and make sure that it is also attached in the show notes. And Chris, man, uh, time flies when you're <laughs> getting educated and having fun. So this has been real, man. I mean, just going all the way back to thinking about you uh, getting started and uh, going through the, the the cold calling and getting into the, uh, into the HR kind of process, payroll process stuff with it, with ADP. And, and from there being able to um, figure out, well, you know what, it wasn't always about just the money. Uh, you started figuring out you wanted to get actively invested in, in real estate. You started doing that. You started realizing you got up to the 22 properties and realized, well, hang on a second. Let me get into something that can really scale you. You pivoted, uh, gave yourself the opportunity to get into commercial real estate. And, and since then, have really been able to lead as a chief investment officer with, uh, with Reliant, uh, which is a top 25 um, operator in the self-storage space. You've uh, carved out a really nice niche. Uh, you've continued to help educate us, helping us to understand more about what the supply chain is in the self-storage space, and even talked about some of the things that you are doing uh, from a fund perspective, what you did in the, in the past with fund number one and some of the things that you're doing now with fund number two. And I am sure because of all this goodness that you've shared with us, there are so many people that are like, oh my God, I got to get in touch with Chris. I need to find out more about what he's doing at Reliant uh, and things like that. So help us understand, Chris, what is the best way to get in touch with you, with your team, find out more? Yeah, I think uh, our website, reliantinvestments.com. So it's investments, plural. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, you can find out what we're doing there. I'm fairly active on LinkedIn. It's Chris with a K. So it's K-R-I-S-B-E-N-S-O-N. So if you reach out to me that way, uh, we'll certainly uh, be able to connect there as well. Okay. Awesome. So check, uh, check Chris Benson out, Chris with a K, K R I S uh, over at LinkedIn or also at Reliant Investments with an S.com. You can find out more there as well. So Chris, man, this has been really, really awesome. Very educational. I'm sure that there are so many people that are going to be reaching out to you and your team. Um, and I really want to thank you for taking the time investing uh, with me and the entire going along audience. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, my pleasure, Billy. Hope you have a good rest of the day. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, also to the Going Long audience, want to thank you once again for joining Chris and I. Uh, Chris really brought lots of knowledge and I'm sure that you have benefited from that. And so as a result, I'm going to ask you to go out and share today's episode with at least two or three other people. Come on, you know, Chris brought a lot of goodness here. So uh, and he and I would also like to know uh, what you thought about the episode. Give us a, give us a review. Let us know what the things that, uh, that we talked about, that Chris talked about, that shared, that really made an impact on you. And also to, um, you know, what, what things you would love for us to talk about in the future. And if you feel like leaving us a five-star rating, you can do that as well. We always accept those. And uh, what I'd like to say until the very next episode, I want to, you to go out and make it a great day. And I'm looking forward to welcoming you back on the next episode. Until then, make it a great day. Freedom. Wow. Don't you love hearing from top-notch experts in the field? You know, when I was getting started, I really wish that I would have had access to such experts. And even more, I wish they would have given me like a really simple list of things to follow so that I could have gotten to my goals much faster and been much happier even sooner. So that's why I've created for you the seven things that you should avoid in order to be successful in long distance investing. And you can pick that up really easily by going to billykeels.com forward slash seven things to avoid. And also, if you liked today's episode, don't forget to leave a five-star review. I'm looking forward to seeing you on our very next episode, so go out and make it a great day.